Well, welcome back everyone. Uh, hopefully you were able to grab a sandwich or something for lunch. So it's my privilege to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, speaker, Dr. Tara Schwetz, who is the Associate Deputy Director of NIH. She reports directly to Dr. Tabak, the Principal Deputy Director of NIH. And she has been actively engaged in, well, a whole, whole host of different things across the NIH. But specifically, she's been engaged in the planning efforts uh, with Dr. Collins and Tabak, as well as the uh, Institute and Center directors on the topics of anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with the recent lifting of the executive order that prohibited us from doing any um, outward planning on these topics, uh, we recently reinitiated some very serious and, and, and really intense planning around the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And Tara agreed to uh, join us today and to give us an update on some of the things that are happening and that you know have been happening in the background and hopefully will actually lead to some pretty exciting developments in the relatively near future. So Tara, the podium is yours. Great, thank you, um, Rick. And, and um, thank you for inviting me here today uh, to talk about this really important topic that has stimulated a lot of discussion um, recently. Uh, in terms of promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion in the biomedical research uh, enterprise. So hopefully I have successfully um, acquired the screen and I'm going to move through things. Um, it's not showing up like it did literally a minute ago. So maybe just, uh, let's see. Okay, great. Um, so let me try to advance. Okay, um, I went a little too far, but there we go, okay. Um, just learning this sort of taking over a, a screen, uh, so bear with me. And you I can guess. use your left and right arrow keys too. Great, yeah. I think I've gotten too used to just saying next these days. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, diversity obviously is one that has been um, a, pretty well studied. There's been lots of uh, papers that you can see a smattering of some of them here that, that uh, highlight the importance of diversity in, in a team, in a workforce, and suggest that uh, diverse teams do outperform homogenous teams. They bring different viewpoints, perspectives, and experiences to help really solve a problem through multifaceted lens. Um, they have been shown in a variety of different publications to be smarter, uh, with sharper performance, have improved in more accurate group thinking. Um, and also to go back and re-examine the facts and data and, and remain objective, really to, to ultimately promote greater innovation. And, and these attributes obviously make a compelling case for fostering a broadly diverse workforce and environment. Um, however, there's also just a, a really simple reason and, and that's um, to do this and that's the, the right thing to do. Um, there we go, the little arrows keep disappearing. Okay, there we go. Um, which is was highlighted in uh, this, this article in Fast Company uh, that, that was published last year. Um, now, if you uh, take a look at the scientific and engineering workforce in the United States, um, you know, the, this workforce doesn't really reflect these um, facets that I just described. So according to data that uh, the National uh, Science Foundation put out uh, back in 2019, um, those identifying as um, Black or African American, Hispanic, and American Indian, Alaska Natives um, are underrepresented in uh, science and engineering fields compared to their proportion in the, the relative US population. So this table here just shows a, a breakdown by race and ethnicity of those um, in uh, science and engineering uh, positions, occupations, and those who have rece received degrees, whether it's a terminal degree or, or an undergraduate college degree. Um, and just for example, you can see here that uh, those identifying as Black or African American um, at the time in 2017, when, when uh, these data were pulled together, um, those identifying as Black or African American made up about 12% of US population. And yet they only account for less than 6% of those in science and engineering occupations. 
Um, and then if you look a little bit uh, closer to home, um, more specifically among the NIH supported workforce, we have sort of a snapshot of, of data for this uh, for uh, our NIH supported PhD recipients. Uh, this is those that are supported on training grants, so our, our Fs and our Ts. Um, and you can see here a graph of the race ethnicity data for these NIH supported PhD recipients. Um, and the biggest thing to note is that, you know, while, you, while we are seeing an increase uh, in the overall absolute numbers, um, particularly the, the absolute number total overall, um, the proportion of those funded by race ethnicity has not really changed that much over uh, the, the last several years. Um, and looking internally within NIH itself, if you look at our overall demographics, um, you know, at first glance, they, they kind of seem okay. Um, obviously, there are areas where we definitely have uh, room for a tremendous improvement, including with um, uh, those who are Hispanics, because uh, that number is quite low. But if you break this down even further to really um, get a better sense of the full picture, a little delay here <laughs> on, on changing the slide. Um, uh, when you look at the, the makeup of our internal PI workforce, our principal investigator workforce by uh, race ethnicity, um, it's overwhelmingly white. Um, and from FY16 to FY20, there really has been little shift in these demographics. And in looking at the NIH funded research on health disparities and minority health, NIH funds about $3.38 billion worth of health disparities research. Um, and this is based on 2019 data. Um, for minority health research, uh, the number we have is about 3.18 billion. Um, just to note that these are numbers that we show in reporter in our reporter uh, categorization. And that means that these codes are not mutually exclusive. Um, so something could be coded both health disparities research and minority health research and show up sort of twice here. But regardless, I think the, the take home really is that um, compared to the overall NIH budget, which is you know um, now stands at about 42 million, these, these numbers here represent a relatively small fraction of the total NIH budget. And, and back in um, 2011, which is now 10 years ago, um, that you know there was a need uh, highlighted um, in a publication that uh, it became abundantly clear from this paper by Genther, Donna Genther and colleagues that Black or African American applicants were less likely to receive NIH funding compared to white applicants. And this highlights this uh, so-called Genther gap that we refer to. Um, you can see that despite controlling for a variety of different parameters, including uh, education, uh, country of origin, origin, the employer that they work for in that environment, that uh, Black or African-American applicants still remain 10 percentage points less likely than white applicants to be awarded NIH research funding. And so in, a, in a, a related commentary by Drs. Collins and Tabak from the same year, they reiterated that these data hold true despite all these different controls um, and recognized that NIH must face the possibility that bias could play a role here. Um, and so uh, this kick started several actions, um, including a report from our advisory committee to the NIH director, or ACD. Um, and, and the ACD uh, diversity working group recommended um, the creation of a chief officer for scientific workforce diversity position across NIH. Um, and in 2013, we appointed our first COSWAD, as we refer to it, um, Dr. Hannah Valentine. And COSWAD is responsible for creating and implementing, coordinating, that's a big part of the responsibility, um, and evaluating the scientific workforce diversity related issues across all of NIH. 
Um, and since uh, its establishment in 2013, um, and has worked on a variety of different things, including you know, kind of laying out uh, the goals uh, and strategy for the office in a strategic plan, helping to really build uh, the evidence by funding studies to look at uh, training programs, mentoring approaches, and other um, uh, other approaches that uh, can help to um, to provide this evidence about what what it, what works and what is effective. Um, help to mitigate some of the obstacles that are being faced uh, by addressing things like implicit bias and microaggressions, um, and also helping to uh, uh, sustain uh, diversity by implementing the evidence-based strategies that you know, they have supported as well. So unfortunately for us, for NIH, um, Dr. Valentine just recently left uh, to return to Stanford. Um, and so while she is definitely sorely missed, um, we are, are currently searching for a new COSWAD, but um, have been very pleased that uh, Dr. Marie Bernard from National Institute on Aging has stepped in to fill the role of acting COSWAD um, until we can um, uh, identify a, a new permanent director of that office. Um, so, um, Additionally, NIH has really launched uh, a variety of different efforts to further enhance diversity. Now, these tend to be focused on the earlier career stages, but really, um, you know, there is a need to, uh, diver uh, to increase diversity efforts across the entire pathway. Um, and I'll just highlight two very briefly here um, that, are, that are on this in this figure. First is the National Research Mentoring Network, or NRMN, which is, um, has pulled together a national network of mentors and, and mentees from a variety of different biomedical disciplines to promote and provide mentorship, professional development, um, and networking opportunities, among other things, um, from the undergraduate level all the way through to early career faculty levels. Um, and then um, another effort that I'll just highlight briefly is the, the build uh, effort. Uh, that's the building infrastructure leading to diversity program. Um, and this is a series of link grants that we give to undergraduate institutions to implement and study really uh, innovative approaches to engaging and uh, retaining students from diverse backgrounds um, in biomedical research, and hopefully you know, they will become a sort of future researchers um, and contributors to the biomedical enterprise. Um, more recently, uh, we launched an effort called the FIRST program or the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation program. Um, and, and this is really all about trying to drive culture change in organizations to create an inclusive environment um, within biomedical research. Uh, and you can you can see the, the, the quote that's outlined here from um, uh, Dr. Collins that was included uh, in the release. And the first program, the first program, um, as I said, is, is really focused on enhancing the en environment in which uh, 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 researchers um, th can thrive. And it's, it's trying to build a self-reinforcing uh, community of scientists through um, recruitment, retention, um, uh, and hopefully uh, eventual promotion through faculty development um, and, and trying to utilize evidence-backed strategies to do so. So this is a $241 million effort um, that will span multiple years. Um, and as you can see, applications are due March 1st. So, um, you know, these are all um, the, the efforts that I've outlined are obviously not, um, you know, the full scope of the different activities that NIH has undertaken in this space. Um, and of course, there, there are definitely um, laudable efforts that have really um, provided some progress. But I think that you know, the events over the last year have really highlighted the continued need 
to be proactive in addressing the realities of inequity in biomedical research. And, you know, NIH is a leader um, in biomedical research who are a major funder and um, you have to recognize NIH's inherent responsibility as, as a leader. Um, and there's shared commitment uh, across NIH leadership to be proactive, to make meaningful substantive changes. But I think you know, no one is, is completely naive and, and recognize that, that changes won't happen overnight. Um, and we are moving, we've moved now uh, for the past several weeks into an administration that does appear to be very supportive of these types of ideas. So we're hoping that you know, this along with um, uh, a variety of other factors will really help to drive this uh, proactive um, and, and um, responsive change. So there were lots of discussions. They had a series of intense IC directors meetings over the last summer um, and, and kind of came to agreement on the need to affect change in both the internal NIH culture as well as um, as try to uh, do our best to impact the uh, external NIH supported community. Uh, I say try because you know we can't control all the factors, but we can uh, obviously have a, an effect on the things that we can control. So just to kind of provide a high level overview of some of the main points that were discussed through those series of meetings, um, those include sort of, as I started the presentation, just an affirmation that diverse teams um, outperform homogenous teams. Uh, scientists and trainees from diverse backgrounds definitely bring different perspectives and can enhance creativity. We also recognize the need to ensure that the biomedical research enterprise, including the sort of underpinning uh, administrative system that supports the the enterprise um, are devoid of hostility. And you know, we can kind of just leave it there at that, but to be more specific, um, any hostility that's grounded in, in race, sex, or other federally protected characteristics. Um, and we have definitely uh, committed to delineate elements that perpetuate the status quo across the entire workforce. And, and there was a recognition that it's really difficult to predict the next source of uh, transformative ideas. And, and in order to not be limiting, we must consider diversity of thought and really um, not just consider it, but uh, support and, and facilitate it and, and allow it to uh, promote uh, activities that catalyze diversity of thought. Um, and that all ideas must be given an equal and fair uh, review and consideration and, and weight. Um, and I think it's definitely true that COVID-19 has highlighted health disparities and health inequities that continue to contribute to morbidity and mortality across the U.S. And obviously, we see this with other um, things, but you know, COVID has, I think, dominated so much of uh, our attention, everyone's attention uh, over the last year. Um, and, and this is just yet another example. Also recognizing an imperative to dig deeper into the fundamental causes of these disparities and inequities, uh, understand the contributing factors, and probably what is most important is to identify possible effective interventions to address them. So just in, in, in summary, sort of some themes about uh, those discussions obviously highlighting the need to listen and learn and acknowledge that there are challenges and problems that need to be addressed um, and articulate the findings that, that we um, uh, we are hearing about and, and are, are pulling together. A, a need to engage communities, a broad swath of communities, communities that we hear from all the time and communities that we do not hear from or engage with as much. There's definitely a need to um, uh, enact some form of culture change uh, in, into the, the way um, you know, uh, science is conducted and, and funded and uh, how the NIH workforce is, is structured. Um, and there's a, sadder, a the saying that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that we 
obviously, uh, you know, are not, again, not naive that this is, <laughs> this is a huge undertaking to try to change culture. Um, but it's definitely something that is uh, very important and, and there's a need to try to do. Um, and we also need to revitalize our current policies and processes um, and, and do so in a very transparent way that provides some benchmarks and metrics to, to allow for some oversight. Um, and then to grow the, the pathway uh, to training and, and mentoring through the professoriate. So that, those were all sort of uh, a summary of the, the sort of ideas and themes that came out of discussions with internal NIH leadership. Um, we also heard some really candid input from uh, other in, internal NIH groups, um, including our, our NIH Black or African American senior investigators. Um, and they proposed um, you know, a handful of solutions that were largely devoted to how we could potentially address intramural recruitment, retention, um, inclusion, et cetera, amongst our, our uh, scientific workforce at NIH. Another group called um, ACRE, or Eight Changes for Racial Equity, proposed really uh, eight distinct, thoughtful, and I, I think quite practical um, changes that could allow us to address diversity, equity, inclusion um, amongst the NIH intramural and extramural workforce. Um, and then finally, we heard from the Anti-Harassment Steering Committee that was originally uh, established, I think, back in, in 2018 that helped to um, uh, initiate and, uh, and um, launch the 2019 NIH anti-sexual harassment campaign. Um, and just got some feedback from them on, uh, you know, insight into uh, racial equity efforts in the context of what they learned and did with the anti-harassment campaign. So taking all of these things in a, in, into perspective and, and uh, looking at the sort of broader scope of all of them, uh, you know, trying to put together an approach that we could uh, try to drive forward to address these uh, different challenges that we are starting to see, um, but also recognizing that we may not necessarily understand all of uh, the, the challenges and problems that we are, are currently facing. Um, and so we've created a series of uh, trans NIH committees that report up internally through our, our governance structure, our NIH steering committee but also externally report to the NIH advisory committee to the director of the ACD. And there are five interrelated but distinct work streams. Um, and, and they're kind of outlined here. I, you know, the, the five areas, again, are really listening to people, um, trying to get a sense of the scope of the challenges, uh, challenges and the problems. Um, as well as we know that people have really great ideas and can help offer some solutions that we could consider. Uh, supporting new research on health disparities and health inequities. Um, thinking about both our internal and external uh, workforce that NIH supports. Um, and then again, as I, as I indicated previously, being able to communicate this with our internal um, and external partners. Um, and so finally, just want to kind of maybe dive just slightly deeper into uh, some of the things that we have discussed. Um, uh, you know, again, gathering feedback, we do want this to be evidence-based and data-driven um, and, and to, to gather input from a variety of different partners, partners that we don't necessarily always traditionally engage with. And then use that information that we're gathering to analyze uh, the data to um, you know, get, take this feedback and modify uh, our practices, policies, um, and help to uh, build and create a, a culture that supports a more diverse and equitable community. Um, and part of that's gonna be driven through increasing the diversity of our staff. Um, and thinking about ways that we could do that through mentorship or other uh, career opportunities. Again, funding research that uh, improves the understanding 
of health disparities and health inequities, the things that drive and cause them, um, and really um, uh, helping to uh, understand the needs of underserved, underrepresented, um, and, and other communities. Uh, and then finally, as I, as I mentioned kind of previously, it's one of the tenets of, of the approach that we're, we're putting forward is to develop a communications plan that really targets a wide variety of audiences. We know that there are a lot of different uh, groups that we will be speaking to as we move forward with a variety of different efforts in this space and wanna make sure that we are communicating effectively and efficiently so that everyone can um, you know, delineate progress, hopefully, that we'll be making. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is establish and, and to implement actionable steps to ensure accountability to NIH's commitment to um, anti-racism and equity and really driving diversity and inclusion um, within the biomedical research enterprise. So with that, um, turn it maybe back to Rick or let, let someone hey, take control of the screen Sarah, again. Sarah, that was uh, just absolutely terrific. So it gives us a sense that you know, things haven't been static. Uh, they've been moving along, lots of planning that's going on. Uh, so let's uh, maybe stop sharing the slides and then open this up and we can see members of council and others. And I see that there are hands that are already raised. So do we wanna start with Irva? And actually for Tara's benefit, could you, when you uh, ask your question, could you give her a little little background on uh, where, where you're from? And so let's see, I think Irva was first, Bob's next, I'm sorry, Marla's next, then Bob. And uh, well, let's, let's start with those three, okay? Actually, I think Marla's hand was up just before I hit mine. Okay, sorry, then Marla, you go first. If you wanna do that. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions, actually, um, and, and a couple of observations. I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep it short just to, for the sake of clarity. But it seems to me, oh, thank you, by the way, for this uh, wonderful presentation. But it seems to me that although the lack of representation of minorities in biomedical research is a structural issue, the solutions that we are trying to implement are individual in nature. Uh, so uh, trying to uh, enhance the experience of particular individuals early career, you know, it addressed the participation of individuals, but it doesn't address the changes in the culture and the structure that keep those individuals out in the first place. So my, my first question is, have we looked into different sets of literature, such as the science of team science, um, a convergence, um, uh, organizational sociology, industrial psychology, even convergence research uh, that uh, would uh, illuminate a little bit more in, in, in this phenomena that um, is not particular to biomedical research, but is spread out across all types of research. Um, and related to that, if this is a spread out phenomenon, have we reached out to NSF and the National Academy of Science to consolidate efforts or to collaborate in efforts to increase diversity in the workforce? Um, and, and, you know, not particularly related to that, but addressing the individuality of the solutions, we have to remember that um, tenure processes and tenure criteria do not incentivize uh, team uh, research or transdisciplinary research. So although we try to focus on individuals, early career individuals, we are going against the current in terms of what they need to do in order to get tenured or in order to advance in their own careers. So what kind of work are we doing with the institutions per se? So we create change in the, in the evaluation criteria so the incentives at the institutional level matches the, the, the needs of, of uh, diversifying the workforce. Yeah, um, I, as, as you were sitting there asking your, your questions of thinking, you know, you, you you could have been in on all the discussions that we've been having for all, for all I could tell, because these are some of the exact same questions that we have been um, uh, 
uh, having over the course of the last several months. Um, definitely agree with you and, and what, the things that we are focusing on currently uh, are sort of trying to shift from that individual approach that, that you mentioned to the more sort of systemic approach, because we know that there are these sort of structural systemic issues that um, are undergirding it. I don't know if we completely know um, all of the, the nuances around that and, and have to better understand that. And, and so that's why one of the things that we wanna start with is sort of by um, you know, gathering data and, and, and helping to um, sort of piece apart exactly what all is going on because we think we know, but we don't want to make an assumption, right? Um, and, and to your point about uh, looking to other colleagues um, uh, and other agencies across the federal government and, and maybe other sectors, uh, yeah, we've actually had those conversations as well uh, to, to you know, kind of figure out what um, what agencies are doing in, in this area, uh, which ones um, we should try to reach out to to, to coordinate um, our efforts or to begin to have some discussions on how we could learn from each other and coordinate uh, as appropriate. So um, I, I think we're all right there with you and on the same page. Great. Appreciate okay. that affirmation that we're <laughs> we're thinking things through uh, um, uh, similarly. Great. So stand by. So I think Irva was next, right? And then Bob, and then Jalone, and then Jose. Right. Irva. Yeah. Hi, um, uh, Tara. Uh, I'm Irva hertz -Pichello. I'm from the University of California, Davis, and I direct one of the um, uh, P30 uh, core centers out of uh, NIHS. Uh, so at our last council meeting, uh, we actually heard from Hannah Valentine, uh, who presented all this, uh, all the data from intramural, extramural, and so forth, uh, and, and and really the state of diversity or inadequacy of the of the diversity um, at, at all those different levels. And one of the take home messages um, that, that I found particularly striking was in the review of applications uh, of people of color uh, that there was, um, uh, you know, fewer were being uh, awarded and that the topics, the topic areas actually tended to differ uh, and that actually many of the, many of black and brown uh, applicants were doing research that had more of a community engaged component to it, um, which it seems to me ought to be, <laughs> it's one of the ways, how do we, you know, how do you achieve that, that actual diversity is you've got these different points of view and different, different values uh, placed on different aspects of the science, which uh, just, I, yeah, I, I thought that was really striking. And I'm, but then that really raises this question of, um, the review panels and um, and what you know if you're changing the culture you have to change the culture of you know the entire academic um, group of, of reviewers who are you know your your awardees and uh, and that's that's a tall order or are there structural things that can be put in place in terms of the review process itself um, that that really addresses um, uh, those somewhat different um, emphases of, of values uh, in in deciding what uh, what should be awarded and 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 what and what not, and, and I'm kind of reminded we had a, a, a an experience recently of reviewing the pilot applications for our pilot program within um, our UC Davis Center, and one of and and our process is we do there's an initial review where there's outside reviewers who rate the science. Um, and then, and then there's also a review of the community engagement part, and then uh, we bring our leadership group together to make the programmatic decision. And there was an application that got a terrible score on from both of the reviewers on the science, and then it got the highest possible score on the community engagement. And then when we listened to the presentation, it was it was this perfect. Um, 
design that addressed a very specific policy and uh, question having to do with notification of pesticide um, applications uh, in, in our state uh, to the communities. And we ended up voting that one the number one, which, um, you know, I felt like we'd really shifted the, the culture of our own, um, our, our own leadership in, within our center to do that because in the past, um, many of the community applications didn't, uh, didn't score well within our internal process. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's the, that seems like that's a really big challenge, but that that's kind of goes to the heart of, of, um, of, of the, uh, the grant situation, the extra meal grants. Right. And, you know, uh, to, to reiterate that, I think a little bit further, some of that, is, and, and to be fair to, to peer review, right, and we have multiple levels of, of peer review um, uh, to try to, to mitigate that a little bit, um, among other things. Uh, but also, uh, it's the priorities that the institutes um, and the NIH as a whole set. And, you know, if we um, are um, much more uh, thoughtful and proactive about setting priorities that are in alignment with um, the types of research that, that you mentioned, community engaged research, implementation science, um, the, those, those things which we've shown, um, are, are truly important. I think, again, I, I, I don't want to keep bringing up COVID, but COVID, uh, I think, has shown this immensely to us. Um, and, and particularly, you know, uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 testing and vaccination strategies um, and the different approaches that, that are, are trying to be leveraged um, and that are understood about what works. Uh, to, to implement those um, efforts within a variety of different communities. Um, but uh, again, to reiterate, you know, it goes back to the priorities we set too. Okay, great, thank you. So let's see, I think Bob, I th think you were next. Yeah, th thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks, Tom, Bob Wright from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, obviously this, this has been a, a, a very, very long standing problem, 400 years. Um, it's, we see a lot of data from the 90s and 10, 20 years ago that showed the problem was there then, it's still here now. Um, I'm part of the problem. You know, my institution is trying to, to fix a lot of these issues and we're working on it here as well. And a couple of things that we've done, and I'm curious if, if NIH has done this, We've hired an outside consultant to evaluate us. So we have an idea of where we are so that we can start to understand where we need to go. But we're also required to put in metrics and a timeline so that we have to see change in certain areas in a certain amount of time. I, I, it may be that that's still being worked out, but I didn't see that in your presentation. I just wanted to ask about that. That's a great point. That is definitely something that we absolutely uh, value and think is an essential part of what we're going to do. Um, I, I will say that this is still uh, kind of in development and so um, uh, stay tuned because more information will will come out over the ensuing weeks um, uh, and, and months in the future but um, you'll and you'll get more detail I think on what what is starting to materialize but I absolutely agree we have to um, set metrics uh, within particular time points and importantly be transparent about them so that people can hold us accountable great thanks uh, Jalan I think you were next yeah dr. chair thank you so much so a couple of folks have <laughs> honed in on some points that I was going to speak to but um, it, Dr. Tara, my perspective is a little bit from lived experience, um, work related to climate justice, environmental justice, and environmental health, and now as a consultant on these issues of advancing racial equity within institutions. And so I definitely want to just um, agree with Irva in terms of, you know, like, how do you change the, the folks that are really change the mindset of folks that are making these decisions that is so critical. Um, the other thing that you brought up uh, was around budget. And I feel like where the money flows is where the focus flows. And so I was really interested in understanding kind of the disparities in budget around minority health, 
uh, and health disparities. Um, has there been any conversation, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the, the weighting or, or the, the different budget amounts? I'm not sure who sets that, but, you know, is that something that you can look at in the future in terms of making sure, like, an emphasis on budget goes to where a lot of the burden is? And so that was the, the one question. Um, and then I just want to, again, second the point around accountability, because as you think about making these plans and reviewing policies and practice, um, you know, it's, it's great to have, again, policies and practices in place, but you have to have some, some measures to make sure that you are making process. And I thought about that and looking at in 2013, as you said in your presentation, the COSWAD, if you call it, that was launched. And I'm just wondering what happened. Um, what worked, what didn't work, and what were the learnings from that? So again, there, you, you are starting with something. Um, and I guess there was one other piece uh, that I'm probably going to forget, but, but that's okay. Um, so really those two things in terms of the budget disparities and then the accountability. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Sure, yeah. Um, in terms of budget, I think um... I think all of you probably are aware that uh, Congress sets the budget for each of the institutes across NIH. So um, each institute uh, receives its individual appropriation. Now, uh, there are sometimes uh, line items for distinct programs that Congress wants to particularly support, but there is still a fair amount of, um, of of wiggle room there uh, in the budget for the institute director and the NIH leadership to um, impart their priorities in the science and the relevant field of science in which they um, are are helping to lead. So you know that's really uh, the space that I think that again um, to um, as, uh, Irva's point um, uh, that around uh, not just a uh, peer review process, which I'm sure that there are definitely things that can be enacted there, but around the priorities that we as an institution set. Because when we set our priorities and we indicate that we have a keen interest in something, um, that helps to uh, catalyze and stimulate uh, research interest in the field, particularly when there are distinct sets of resources that are, are put behind that. Um, so and, and Dr. Chair, I'm sorry, I remembered my last point. And just the, the fact of, as you think about the priorities and planning, are you co-creating those with the folks that you want to benefit from the process? Uh, and so maybe as those, you know, folks that have applied for grants and haven't received them or are other folks that have been successful. So I really think that's super important as you think about not only the accountability piece, but as you think about planning and, and practices and, and really kind of integrating, you know, the, the, the process. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that's why one of, uh, one of the important, I think, initial starting points, and it's, it's definitely, it's not a, a sort of one-off <laughs> um, time point uh, or activity, um, but uh, that's listening and, um, and engaging with communities. And, and I mean that in the broadest sense possible. So all of the different stakeholders that we would consider traditional NIH stakeholders, but also folks that we don't necessarily hear a lot from. We wanna make sure that we target those because um, we wanna understand if, there's, if there are structural reasons why we're not engaging with them. Maybe we want to be engaging with them, but we aren't as much as, as we could be and need to figure out why and what we can do to help promote those uh, interactions. Um, and uh, uh, so that will be an iterative process. Uh, it will continue over the, the course of this effort. Um, again, it's you know, while we have uh, done a variety of different things over the years uh, to enhance uh, diversity um, across different NIH programs, uh, I think we're sort of trying to take a step back and say, all right, <laughs> there's been a lot of stuff done. It has, there has been some progress, but, um, you know, this is, this is a big, long-standing challenge 
we need to, to just pause and take a second and really reflect on what we as an institution can do and really try to take this more sort of systemic uh, approach rather than kind of one-off targeted areas that we might see uh, a need for uh, trying to address. Great, Kara, thank you. So let's see, I think Jose, you were next. And then Chuck May and then Len. Great, hi Tara, uh, good to see you. Um, Jose Cordero and uh, my two jobs. I'm, I'm the co-director of PROTECT, uh, which, which is a super fun uh, research center, but also co-director of an uh, ECHO cohort, uh, one of the 140 some ECHO cohorts in the uh, program. I have two questions. And um, for, first, let me say that uh, it's really impressive what NIH is doing, especially focusing in terms of enhancing diversity, inclusion, and uh, in uh, extramural programs. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, interesting challenges for NIH is that uh, leadership, say at the division level branch, uh, and uh, the lack of diversity in that group. And uh, so maybe if you could just talk a little bit about what NIH is planning to do uh, in terms of enhancing diversity with the leadership uh, in institutes and divisions and so on. And, uh, uh, but also I think that you, uh, earlier today, we were, uh, uh, someone mentioned uh, about that 70 to 90% of disease burden is related to environmental. And here we're also talking about challenges of health disparities and the impact on health. And uh, it turns out that when we look at the budget of uh, like the Health Disparities Institute of NIHS, um, it's in the lower side. And uh, so the other question is, I don't understand that Congress is uh, who decides funding for different institutes and so on. But you talk a little bit also about uh, efforts to enhance uh, budget or efforts in terms of both environmental and health disparities. Sure, no, thanks. Jose. Um, so uh, in terms of the first question that you asked about the diversity of our internal uh, workforce, um, we're, as was we sort of rethink this approach um, and establish the approach we're setting going forward for addressing these issues. Um, internally, this is a huge challenge for us. I'd say it goes beyond the scientific workforce to across the entire um, uh, NIH workforce, but specifically around uh, leadership. I think uh, as kind of our data show, and I know specifically within the OD where I, I sit um, in the Office of the Director, you know, as you move uh, up the sort of leadership ladder, if you will, um, it gets more and more white and more and more male. Um, that, that's just, that's the reality that we are living in right now. And so I think that, um, that there's definitely uh, a, a case to be made for enhancing diversity as you've shown, uh, uh, as we've seen through some of the slides I presented uh, earlier, you know, diverse teams um, are more effective, more creative. It's, it's also a good thing to do. So uh, this is definitely something we have to try to, try to tackle. Um, and then in, in terms of the budget issue, again, you know, setting aside the um, congressional appropriations for a second, um, you mentioned uh, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, that is one institute that it, its primary focus is, um, of course, on minority health and health disparities related issues. But each of our, uh, you know, 26 other uh, institutes and centers also um, uh, fund uh, research on minority health and health disparities. And actually the bulk of research that's funded in that space across NIH is from other institutes, uh, if you, if you uh, sort of aggregate everything. Um, and so there is a lot more room there, uh, we think, to be able to um, enhance and uh, promote research. Now, also might benefit from having additional um, uh, collaborations and facilitations and maybe that one space that that could be discussed is the potential environmental 
effect. I know that there are some institutes that are very interested in this, um, including the National Institute of Nursing Research, which I uh, was previously uh, connected with for about the last year or so. Okay, great. And I think Shukme was next, and then Lynn, and then we have we've got five minutes left. We're gonna, you know, Tara has a hard stop right at 1.30. We want to give her a five minute break. So okay, Shukme, will... do you have a two and a half minute question? Yeah. So I'm gonna be really very brief. I thought of three points that were not raised before. First is about pipe pipeline, it's about competition. So we are competing for talents with all the other institutes and also outside science. So basically every, every corporations are looking for diversity. So therefore we have to expand the talent pool from different sources that we have not seen before. For example, I would have to say, what about the dreamers? What about uh, people who return to work? They have gone out to the non-academic and come back. So those are all possibilities. Second, it's about extension of time for qualification of something. For example, the K99 R00 asks for the fourth year. You have to apply by the time of the fourth year. Is that possible to extend it a little bit? So that is another point, meaning that either stop, there's reason to stop the clock, then it, it can be excused. So that's the that's second point. The third point is again, not a question, is about a parallel enhancement program. We can't ask uh, minorities to uh, buy a house or help them to buy a house if we cannot repair their credits. So it is important to do all this preparation and enhancement programs alongside with anything that we're doing. So those are just the three points I want to make. It's not a question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shukne. So Lynn, uh, you can wind it up here. Uh, do you have a question for Tara? I do, and I'll also go quickly. Thank you very much, Rick, and thank you, Tara, for a great presentation. Those uh, That was really fabulous. Two points I want to make. One is the first um, process. Um, you know, we're not going to win one, but the process that is that an institution has to go through to apply for one is really good in terms of addressing structural things, you know, around hiring, promotions, tenures, um, putting together um, mentoring um, across schools, hiring people in clusters. So um, I'm encouraging, um, I mean, we're gonna do it, you know, because I think it's good for us to do the work that we have to do in order to put in the application. And I think it's a great way for NIH to motivate institutions to do the right thing. The, the other thing that I wanted to say, and this is far more complicated, but I think a lot of the structural issues that are, are important are part and parcel of also the structural issues that are barriers to team science and some of the other problems that we're trying to address. And what I mean by that is way too much authority and power winds up in the hands of just a few PIs who have too much, too much power and tend to get very narrowly narrowed down on people who look like them, who think like them, who do the kind of work that they do. And I'm, I'm thinking, Tara, that some of the work that you're trying to do about structure um, could help not only in dealing with some of these issues around structural racism, as well as, to be honest, gender bias and other forms of bullying, but also to, to make some profound changes, you know, in how we reward science and, um, and try to, you know, disperse that because there's something that happens culturally when you have a few people with so much power invested by an institution that just isn't good no matter who they are, if they're male, female, whoever they are, it's not a good thing. So thank you. Um, thank you though, Tara, for um, your presentation. It was really, really great. Yeah, I think those are important points and, and it's sort of cyclical, they feed into each other, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that that's definitely something that um, needs to be considered as we move forward. Well, I think we better wind up, Tara. We're going to give you we're going to give you five minutes so that between you know, the Zoom sessions this afternoon, you'll have at least a little time to take a break. So thank you very much, and um, I look forward to continuing to work with you and the other IC directors and and others across the NIH. Uh, there are going to be a lots lots of additional intense sessions that are coming up. 
And so I'm sure that there will be some very interesting things that we'll be able to come back and report to council at a later date. So thank you very much. And so Pat, can I turn it back over to you? And what's next on the agenda? Uh, and, and thank you, Tara, I appreciate uh, my thanks as well. Um, our, John, I, I sent you a small two slide um, presentation. Can you pull that up? We're gonna move on to talk about the, um, the um, continue our DEI discussion, talk about the, uh, the rollout of our um, working, the council working group. And we it, had just- It's coming up. Okay, thank you. Great, so I'm unmuted, uh, Pat. You want me to take over here? Yeah, if you want to uh, look, I, just, I will, you can mention that Karen not, did not make it today. She's caught up in the weather down in Texas as well, but Karen Vasquez was uh, unable to make it, so. Well, well, we'll start the discussion here. We'll get some input from council, and then the next time we meet, uh, the chair of our new committee will have a chance to chime in and to give us some of her ideas. So I just want to announce that, and we I talked about this last time, but this whole topic of anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is so important. It's a very complicated problem and we're not gonna do something immediately and then it's gonna solve it and it's gonna go away. So in my mind, uh, one of the first steps is to make sure that we put together a working group of council so that we can be reaching out into all of the different sectors of the environmental health sciences community and that we have a means that there's a mechanism to make sure that there are best practices. And there are uh, very important issues that need to be brought to the attention, to my attention or the attention of the senior leadership team at the Institute, that we have that mechanism in place. And so after much discussion about this, we decided that a working group of council would be an ideal way of making this happen. So the working group, as you can see here, is charged with <clears throat> so it's advisory to council, to all of you, and it's advisory on the matters of racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, primarily as they apply uniquely to research in the environmental health sciences community. Uh, so there could be just examples of the types of things that uh, the working group discusses and then brings to council and brings ultimately to me would be uh, best, best approaches for recruitment and retention of talented individuals from underrepresented minorities. Um, so are there examples at universities and other institutions? Uh, we don't have to invent this at, uh, at the NIH. Um, if there are great examples and best practices at other organizations, uh, we hope that this working group can be a mechanism through which we learn more about these things. Also, we wanna talk about the, the clear gaps that exist within research funding related to race and ethnicity. And uh, so we'd like to know whether they're well, learning about these things and then rolling up our sleeves and potentially coming up with uh, mechanisms to address these things. And to do this in a way that it's not just NIHS working in isolation, but working together with the other ICs and, and following from some leadership, we hope, well, we know we'll be coming from building one and from Drs. Uh, Collins and Tabak. So in doing this in, a, in an integrated and coordinated way, it's important. And again, identifying those factors that may cause inequity in funding across racial and ethnic groups. So you know, working with our colleagues across other parts of the, of the NIH and really working specifically and then developing metrics. I mean, as Tara was saying, it's not just about talking about these things, but coming up with very specific things we can be doing, action points with metrics and deadlines so that we can you know, make tangible progress. So again, this, this working group is designed to provide uh, advice to, to me and to senior leadership here at NIEHS. And then we will factor this into the plans that we will be developing to address the issues of racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So next slide, please. So we've, we've taken the, uh, so you know, Pat and I, together with uh, other members of leadership, have discussed this and we've taken the liberty to uh, select a, a chair of council. So uh, Karen Vasquez has uh, agreed to do this. And unfortunately she's some, well, she's in Texas right now trying to figure out, well, trying to stay warm and, and figure out how to get her utilities back on again. Uh, but she'll have a chance to you know, talk about the, the working group and plans for the working group the next time that we meet. 
So what we've done is we put together a draft charter for this working group. And, and we were happy to share that with others. And we can fine tune the charter. And so we're looking for uh, other members of uh, council to join. Uh, so we're looking uh, Jose Codero, uh, Edith Parker, and Andy Shee uh, to be joining for, for the, uh, the working group. Uh, we're also looking for members of academia, industry, government. Uh, to be joining. So we have George Dast, uh, Jast, Dastin from uh, Procter & Gamble who has agreed to join. And we're also looking for a couple of representatives from NIEHS, uh, one from the extramural uh, division and one that involves the, say, the intramural efforts across the, the various divisions here. So we're looking at a working group of 12 to 15 members. And there are still many slots to fill. So one thing we had asked Karen to do if she would have been here today was uh, discuss some of her vision for where to take the efforts of this working group and then uh, let all of you know what mechanism she's gonna be putting in place to attract additional membership to the working group. So let's see, Pat, is there anything that I'm missing here? No, I think you covered, I'll just, I'll just add a couple of things. Um, so when we were discussing with Karen and like, um, like Rick says with other leadership, numerous leadership, we decided to take approach to populate this uh, working group by start trying to start with a small group, kind of nucleate the, uh, the, uh, the team. And so we um, talked about starting with a few members of council and we just after some discussion selected Jose, Edith and Andy, I believe she contacted you all. I hope so. I hope we're not springing this on you right now. And um, through some of her efforts, Karen um, identified George Daston, who is, uh, he's in SOT. I don't know if he's the next president or one after that, but he's also done a lot of work with Procter & Gamble around diversity and equity. Um, and our idea was, as Rick said, not to fill out our full 12 to 15, but to try to leave some room to add um, people. And so Karen would, would have been here asking your, to you to send her nominations for people that you would like to include. And, and this is not just today, but going forward, of course, um, so that we can, you know, fill the, the team as we go. And I just kind of want to re-emphasize that this is actually advising council. This is not advising Rick or senior leadership here. So, um, this is this is not the only group that's going to be dealing with the DNI issue. Council will be dealing with as a whole. This is just a group where you can get more outside people to help council deal with it. So I just want to make sure that if you're not on this committee, you're still I mean on the working, we're still expected to be heavily involved in this DEI effort. So that just does a couple points, right? And Pat, I'm glad you brought that up. So this is a working group, an advisory group to council. And I see in the chat box that Edith, Jose, and Andy have been contacted by Karen. So maybe Jose um, um, uh, or Andy or Edith, uh, do you want to chime in and make any comments? Well, um, uh, I just want to say thank you for including me. And I think that this is a very important uh, uh, group and, uh, and um, understand the, how it's connected to the council and that makes sense and um, look forward to um, meeting Karen, who I haven't met. And, uh, but I think this is a great start. Terrific, great. Um, Rick, Rick, we've had a couple of uh, chats entered that I think are worth uh, looking at. So Katrina asked, um, do, why don't we call out specifically community? I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to consider. I guess we should also mention that the charter that Rick talked about is really not the final. We're kind of close to final, but we want to kind of round off the edges, but we would like the team, the working group to, to be involved in, in kind of doing that. So that's an excellent point. Um, and I think Terry included also maybe tribal, but again, we can, we can consider Great point. that. Really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Well, if there are nominations, uh, you know, contact Karen. Yeah. Looks like Andy has his hand up. Uh, thanks. I just want to echo uh, what Jose said. Uh, appreciate being uh, have the opportunity to serve, and uh, we've actually often speak have been undergoing similar processes for the past three four months. So it's a really good opportunity to learn from uh, what's happening in EHS as well as uh, 
uh, contribute in, in, in going forward. So thank you. Terrific, great. Well, thanks again, Andy, for your willingness to do this. So other comments? Yeah, this is uh, Edith, and I think I'll echo what, um, what others have said, but I also want to just say, um, as you pointed out, we're a working group for the council, and I think uh, what I was going to say has already been emphasized that the council has so many great ideas, so I hope people will keep, um, you know, put, we're contacting us and letting us know, because already we have great examples of, of areas that we need to start thinking about addressing, so just wanted to say that. Perfect. Great. Excellent. And I have gotten a couple of nominations on chat as we've been sitting here, so thank you for those. So, okay, other comments? Any additional thoughts? Sound like the right thing to be doing? Yes. Um, if I may, uh, there is an initiative that I was contacted for, um, the Council of Councils Working Group on Integrating Social Research. Maybe mm -hmm. there should be some connection between this working group and the Council of Councils Working Group because the integration of social research is not only for the uh, funded research that we do, but also in the way we operate as an organization. So that's, that's my, my thought. Yeah, Marla, I think that's a really good point. And it's something that I can tell you that the IC directors and both Francis and Larry are very conscious of. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone doesn't just go out on their own and start doing all of these different things. Uh, we wanna make sure that it's coordinated. So uh, very specifically with this working group, working with you know, in coordination with other working groups, as well as the, the working group for the advisory committee for the director. I mean, they will, uh, they will be taking on the additional responsibilities of, um, of, of not just about gender equity, but also the issues around race, racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I, my expectation is that we'll have good coordination uh, with the working group on the NIHS Council and the this working group for the ACD. So lot, lots of things to be coordinated. And uh, you know, again, this, this issue of coordination and to make sure that we're all kind of marching in the same direction and not tripping over each other is really important. Because I, I can tell you that there's just a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of interest in doing things quickly. So let's just make sure that we're doing things quickly that are in alignment and they're synergistic. So great point. Other comments? Jalan? Yeah, I just have a quick question on that point around coordination. Who is going to be the point person for that? Uh, is it a full-time position uh, that will be essentially hurting all the cats in the different silos? No, that's another great question. And it's, I guess it, it's premature at this point for me to actually speculate on how that's ultimately gonna end up, but that's been an active point of, of conversation. So suffice it to say, uh, stay tuned, and hopefully in the next uh, couple of weeks or so, there'll be some specific communications that'll be coming out of the NIH that uh, will address this. I just, uh, it just at this point, um, you know, I can speculate, but uh, my prediction is that you'll be hearing something more specific coming out soon. Katrina, thanks again for just raising the whole issue. Community needs to be very explicitly stated in there. So we'll, so Kat, I, I wanna make sure that we are modifying the charter accordingly so that we can add that language specifically to the, the charge, as well as tribal. I mean, let's, let's call out tribal as well, absolutely. And they deserve special mention and not just part of the et cetera. Uh, Trevor, it looks like you have your hand up. Okay, Trevor, your hand is up, but we can't see you and we can't hear you. There we go. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I was actually reminiscing over Tara's uh, presentation about the funding pay line that uh, really seems deleterious to uh, individuals of uh, color, black and brown. 
And, you know, I know here, I know at Penn, for example, that every um, recruitment we have is mandatory that we have a diversity officer that's present on that um, uh, recruitment committee. And I'm wondering whether it would make sense to have a diversity member mandatory for study sections. That's actually a really interesting point. So, um, Pat, let's let's make sure we capture the, this in the minutes, and and <clears throat> let's make sure that we follow up with Tara on that. In fact, I, I will personally make sure that that I will bring that to the discussions with the IC directors. Very interesting, very interesting thought. And that is one of the things that I would like to see the, the working group tackle um, is is how do we um, address the funding gap that we've talked so much about. And um, one of those ideas is, is, do we need to tweak the, uh, the review process? So that's that's great. Thank you, Trin. Great. Marla, I see that you have your hand up. And then Jose is next. Yes, um, uh, thank you. I, I would like to bring also a, a comment that Katrina made. I, I, I'm sure that she can go deeper on this, but uh, it, her comment was on uh, the follow-up that um, uh, it was done to comments on increasing diversity and, and um, um, increasing the reach of uh, the work NIEHS does. Um, what, in what way can we make more explicit the follow-up that uh, uh, NIEHS uh, gives in the operations of the agency to the recommendations that the council makes? Well, I think part of it is that, and this would be you know, part, of, part of my responsibilities is to come up with very specific metrics and uh, deadlines and the types of things that, um, that we want to achieve. So you know, stay tuned on that. Let's try to frame the recommendations in the context of, um, you know, specific deliverables. And then we'll, we'll work with you and, and to develop, you know, those, um, those deliverables and, you know, do our best to achieve them. Does, did, does that answer your question? Um, yes, I will copy and paste uh, Katrina's comment on the chat because I think that she made a very particular comment and, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's not only about that, but it's, it's, it's reflective of a lack of um, follow-up on particular uh, recommendations that we, we, I think it will be better to address it. Okay. Sounds good. So I'll, I'll wait to see this when it comes in in the chat. So let's see, Jose was next and then there you go. Katrina has both clapping hands and her hand up. So, but I think Jose was first, if I remember correctly. So, oh yeah, well, okay. I just go ahead. I just want to follow up on Trevor's uh, comment about the diversity officer. I think that that is a very good start, and that's uh, the place to start. Uh, but <clears throat> having been in study sections, and uh, the there is a lot of uh, homogeneity, and it's not only in terms of uh, the, uh, um, the basically the topic, but but also certainly. Uh, not a great deal of diversity, at, at least from the times that I, that I was involved in that. Um, and uh, so I think that there is a need to perhaps diversity officer as a beginning, but uh, the real basis should be that, that there is a good process that ensures that, that there is a broad diversity within study sections, which we don't have. I think that we still could do better on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we can do better. Uh, very intriguing to have a, a diversity officer connected with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Katrina, you've got your hand oh. up. So, yes, so I'm going to pull a Lynn because yesterday Lynn gave us an idea for a discussion at council next time. And I loved her ideas, so I don't want this to supplant it. But I remember at the beginning of our meeting last time, Pat said, like, there's sort of two sides to this issue. One is, um, who's doing the work and the other is what we're doing. And we're gonna focus mostly this meeting on who's doing the work and how to diversify the workforce. The next meeting, we're gonna talk about this. And I think this meeting, we've, we've still been focused mostly on this, but we have had some recent conversation about the interaction. So I would really treasure the opportunity to have a devoted time to really talk about 
what is the nature of what we're funding and how we prioritize it. And you know, things like we talked about yesterday, how, what does this mean for how we define innovation? I saw that was the second charge of the working group. So I know they'll be digging in, but I hope you'll, you'll make a nice big um, chunk of space for council to, to dig into that in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. You're right. I, I did. You're right. I did say that, and we we didn't quite get there this round, but we'll try to get it on the agenda for for May, uh, June council. Thank you. Okay. Well, Pat, that's that's a uh, that's a deliverable from you. You're the one that uh, takes the charge to put together this agenda. So let's make sure that's on on for next time. You know, to, to Katrina's point, and 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 certainly we we haven't had a chance to to meet Karen or to meet together, but might be we could talk when the committee does about strategies to have a dedicated time to reach out to each council member and pick their brain about different ideas and then bring that back together again before we meet Katrina um, both you know so that we could answer the questions you have but also see what are the data people want to see and also what are the ideas I think our our meetings are sometimes constrained for us to be able to pick everybody's brain so that might be a way to do it offline Sounds good. Great. Other comments? Well, looks like everyone's probably zoomed out for today. Gwen, I saw that you just turned on your camera. Did you want to make yeah. a comment? Sure. I just wanted to follow up on the, um, the NIH uh, Advisory Council to the director. I believe the, uh, there's a session that is already scheduled for February 26th at 3.30, where there'll be a more in-depth conversation that I think follows on to some of the uh, ideas that Tara presented today. So um, it's already been posted in the Federal Register. And if you go to the uh, Advisory Committee for the Director's webpage uh, out of Dr. Collins's office, you can um, view that. And I think you'll be able to link to that meeting directly from that website. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to listen. I will certainly be listening to that presentation. Gwen, thanks for pointing that out. And I want to encourage everyone, if you're interested in this topic area, uh, which I suspect uh, all of you are, strongly encourage you to carve out that time and listen in for that special session of the ACD. And if you can't find the link, just uh, email us and we'll get it to you. Uh, yes, actually, uh, Gwen, do you have the link? Could you put it in the chat box for others to cut and paste? Um, I'll look for it while we're going, but we don't have that much more time in the meeting. If we don't get it in the link in the chat today, uh, I think uh, Pat staff can send it out to all the council members. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Well, let's see. Are there any other uh, just general comments we want to make? Otherwise, I can give about 10 minutes back to the rest of you. You can take a little break before I'm sure you have another Zoom meeting coming up at 2 o'clock. Irva, did you have a point to make, or are you just uh, thumbs, up <laughs> thumbs, up. thumbs up for an extra 10 minutes? Rick, before we get too far, I want to um, say thank you to the people who have put this together. So uh, obviously, Liz McNair is uh, always uh, the person that makes this thing run with help of uh, Rosemary um, Moody. And of course, we can't forget the uh, fellows that make this uh, Zoom thing work, Nathan Michener and John Maruka. And I know we Poor John, I've been torturing him, sending him PowerPoints back and forth. So uh, thank you guys for doing such a great job. It looks like Irva had a question, comment. <laughs> Actually, uh, just to be a little provincial here, but is it possible since it's not going to the end of your East Coast afternoon that we could not start at 7 a.m. Pacific time? Mm -hmm. We're just, just an idea, so. That, that's a great suggestion. Let's see if we can be a bit more accommodating for those in the West Coast. My brain works better a little later. <laughs> Pat, is that, uh, do you think that's gonna be possible? Absolutely. I, I kind of randomly picked 10 o'clock. I can certainly pick 11 o'clock. I didn't Pat, want to put too uh, much to close to our lunch. So we start for work for an hour and then stop and eat lunch, you know, but, but yeah, absolutely we can accommodate um, the West well, Coast. Well, Pat's someone who is typically uh, up at about four uh, or 5 a.m. <laughs> Yeah. So he's not going to get much sympathy uh, from the rest of us. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the so, uh, West Coast could become a little bit more like Spanish and eat like a little bit later than noon at one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, um, and, and by the way, check the chat box. The, the 
the URL for the ACD meeting has been posted a, a number of times. So go ahead and cut and paste that. And again, I encourage you, uh, you know, if, if you're inclined, so inclined, this is uh, it's going to be a great meeting. So, so let me just say thank you all for a very engaging meeting today. Lots of different topics that came up. And, um, and Katrina, we'll make sure that we, we get this scheduled appropriately the next time around. Okay, so I will officially, I guess, uh, my tapping on my, whatever, my, my mallet here, I will officially adjourn today's meeting and thanks everyone. So thank goodness we don't have to run to an airport. So we can actually <laughs> run off our next Zoom meeting. Okay, bye everyone. See you in a few months. Bye. Bye. Okay. bye.